uh, Jakub or, well, they call me Jake now because we figured out that in a company we've got three other Jakubs and uh, I was refused to be called Jakub again and uh, so I had to adapt. Um, I'm coming from a company called iSci and uh, yeah, hooray, another presentation of a company. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about how we use Python in a new space industry. Right, so it wouldn't be a space talk without this. Ah, so um, yeah, we do space and um, there was this keyword called new space and what's the difference between a new space and an old space and uh, it's quite, you know, simple. So old space used to be done before for big money for uh, large teams or by large teams and uh, it was very expensive and very precise. New space still has to be very precise, but we don't have to spend that amount of money nowadays and we can try and experiment um, already for just a fraction of the price. I will get to it later. And um, obviously uh, there's a very famous uh, sentence that we use and it's called debugging on orbit. And, uh, you know, in old space, you could not do that. In new space, uh, you can, but nobody likes to talk about it. So, who am I? Um, I'm usually very shy. Uh, and uh, that's why I came up with this photo of me. Uh, it's a mock picture of uh, David Tr uh, Dwight Schrute from The Office, if somebody's looked at it. Okay, so. I started with programming when I was a 10 because uh, I was living in a bloody village and uh, there were no computer games at the time, so you had to come up with your, uh, with your own. Uh, I picked up C++, so in, uh, when I was 14 I was able to do C out. Then I was work as a contractor in uh, e-commerce, uh, financial institutions and some media. I was always a Python enthusiast because it's easy, it's nice, it's clean. Well, you all know why, because you're here. I'm a geek. I have a big backpack running around as well, so you can see that. Uh, I like to play computer games and everything. My BMI also says that. I'm a space cowboy now. Um, when I was, uh, so a little story that uh, I should not talk about, but well, let's say. Uh, so, uh, when I was getting hired, I was visiting my friend in northern England and uh, after a couple of beers, obviously, you, you received an, a LinkedIn message like, would you like to work for a space? <laughs> yeah, obviously. So I said, yes, but only if I can have uh, my signature as a space cowboy. And they agreed. So now <laughs> my official job title was space cowboy. Um, I'm self-certified diet expert. Uh, I know exactly why I sh what I should not eat, then I eat it and regret it. <laughs> and I'm round earther. Uh, so, <laughs> thank you. The, in, I, I can't believe that in 2019 it is an advantage. <laughs> so, what do we do actually in ISI? Uh, we build SAR satellites. So. I will get into what it is SAR uh, again slightly bit later. This is uh, our uh, CEO, uh, Rafael, and he's now doing some hardware stuff that I absolutely don't understand. But uh, what it is, is uh, we build something like this, and it's, imagine it as a washing machine with wings. Uh, from, as those wings are very important uh, because those are the radars. Uh, there's a difference between uh, two types of satellites, so you can have either optical one or the SAR one or the rest. <laughs> and uh, the difference is that uh, here, I will get into that, uh, so this is the synthetic aperture radar, and what it does is it sends a wave to Earth, it registers the flashback, and from that, we can build an image. So that has amazing advantage that uh, we can take a picture of Earth even during the night. Or uh, the weather condition does not matter for us. So if there's a storm, if there's a snow, it does not matter. 
we can always take a picture. Uh, obviously, it's not very colorful, but uh, at least you can see what's going on there. Um, we can monitor large areas. Uh, the speed that we go, it usually takes uh, quite some uh, chunk of Earth. So, for example, I'm originally from a little town called Kremnica, and I wanted to take a picture of it. And, uh, yeah, I actually have almost whole Slovakia in it, because <laughs> the size of the actual image. Um, and when you download it, it has around 10 gigabytes uh, on your hard drive, so, yeah, it, it is quite good. Um, also, if you uh, miscalculate it and you go one second further, then you're suddenly in Poland. And uh, yeah, 700 kilometers per second or something like that. It is quite large uh, difference. So this is the S uh, SAR image uh, when it's processed. When we take it, uh, it is just a binary data. It really represents nothing. But then through um, a long, long uh, processing, uh, we can get a real image like this. So obviously, uh, you can see there uh, uh, and distinguish what is a road, uh, what's a field, what is uh, a tree. Well, not a single tree, but obviously <laughs> a whole forest of it. Um, and uh, this is an example that we were taking picture of uh, uh, ice cover between uh, Helsinki and Tallinn. Uh, so we're based in Helsinki, and this was quite interesting for us because we wanted to go to Tallinn for a party. Uh, so, another thing is that, uh, oh yeah, uh, ISI, uh, I was really for, for a long time thinking that it, it is coming from ISI with my little eye, but it's not. Uh, apparently, uh, the project started as an uh, ice cover monitoring tool, so uh, there comes the ice, and I, yeah, I, that's easy. Um, so now the usage, uh, how can you use image like that? Um, so first of all, we do flood mapping. Uh, we have the delivery of an image within two hours, or, or we aim for that. Uh, you can try to map, uh, for example, when a flash flood happens, uh, we, what size of an area has been uh, affected, and then the first response can uh, extend their search, for example. Um, fast natural catastrophe response, uh, we had uh, taken a pictures of uh, some volcanoes, for example, already, uh, and again, uh, there were some uh, catastrophe going on around the world, and we are able to monitor it, and then again, uh, send um, the data to, um, f let's say, first response, or someone ha that has to deal with it, uh, so government, uh, and to minimize the uh, effect on, on people uh, around that area. Uh, crop monitoring, yield prediction, and crop damage assistant, uh, assessment. Uh, as you could see on the previous image, uh, you can uh, monitor fields, and uh, you can then assess how much of the yield uh, will be at the end of the season. Uh, there, if there's a crop damage, for example, due to the fire, you are then able to assess how much of the yield, again, will be after the fire. Um, coastal security. Uh, sea is perfect for taking pictures because it's flat. And uh, it's very easy to distinguish ships. And nowadays, everyone likes to keep their borders closed for some reason. And uh, they would like to monitor uh, if there are some um, not great and um, friendly ships around we can mark them. Um, iceberg monitoring, uh, let's say that maybe this wall will not be necessary in the next 10 years, uh, as they will all melt. Uh, but currently, we can still see them. Uh, prevention of illegal fishing. This is quite important. Uh, now we had some partnerships with other companies. And uh, it's, as I said on, on C, it's very easy to monitor uh, ships. So we are able to figure out which ship has um, the permission to actually be there and which doesn't. And given that we would like to deliver the processed image within, uh, let's say, 30 minutes from acquisition, uh, we are able to notify uh, police or someone who has to deal with it, and they, they can still send a helicopter to catch the bad guys. 
Well, that sounds extreme. And oil spill monitoring. Unfortunately, oil spills are, are still happening, so uh, we can monitor it, and uh, later on we can even predict which way it goes, uh, so people can prepare. Uh, and so we want to also do satellite constellation. Currently, we have in space uh, two satellites. The idea is we will extend it slightly more. I downloaded a video and, and never before put it into presentation, so let's see if it works. It actually does, wow. It does not have a sound though, so I have to talk around it. Um, so currently, uh, or when we tried uh, the first idea, we had only one satellite. Uh, it has the polar orbit, orbit and it is able to orbit through the, uh, or around the whole world. The only problem is that if you want to take a picture of the same area, you have to wait for 24 more days until it returns back to the original point. Uh, so when I first ordered the picture of Kremnica, uh, we missed it by that one second, and then I had to wait 24 more days for, uh, you know, uh, for it to return. I actually told my dad to wave on, <laughs> on a satellite, so he was spending a good two hours outside and just waving and smiling. <laughs> Maybe I overestimated how good the resolution is. Um, so then we add more satellites. Uh, so this is the end result. We would like to have 18 satellites by end of uh, 2020, I believe. And uh, in that case, we are able actually to take a picture of the same place uh, within the next two hours. So for example, you can monitor, um, as we were talking about the oil, oil spills, you can monitor which way it goes within two hours. Uh, or a fire or uh, usually those catastrophes or those illegal fishing ships. Uh, anyway, uh, so you are able to take the picture every two hours and download it every 30 minutes. So it is quite near real time. Uh, due to the processing power, it, it will not be in foreseeable future uh, in minutes, unfortunately. Well, 30 minutes is quite good still. Uh, now I have to learn how to put the next slide. Oh, good. Um, so what's the advantage of ca uh, satellite constellation? So it is really cost efficient. Uh, when you wanted to send a big satellite before and uh, it was taking maybe 24 days to uh, return back to the, uh, the same place, or if you had this uh, stationary satellite about your um, area of interest, so maybe a government had something, um, it was uh, very costly to put one satellite up for just one uh, government body. Now, if you have a constellation of, let's say, 18, then they can hire just a small uh, amount of time from us, and we will deliver the picture a lot faster uh, with relatively good quality. Um, also, given that the satellite that we build is the size of a washing machine, let's say, it's still quite cheap compared to those big guys to build. Uh, so uh, when you need to replace it within, I don't know, 10, 20 years, uh, it's not a big hit on your wallet. Uh, the, yeah, we can deliver the data more reliably because uh, if just accidentally happens that one satellite missed it, yeah, within two hours you have another image. Uh, as I was mentioning before, uh, near real time, 30 minutes is quite good uh, to get the data. Um, and we can get it more and more often. So if we decide later on that 18 satellites is not good enough, we can scale it up uh, until well, quite a, a large amount. Um, and we can cover the globe very easily. And we also do data services. So when you take an image, yeah, it's nice looky-looky and uh, you can see the forest and something, but the image has quite a lot of data itself. So yeah, we apply machine learning, AI and other cool words uh, on top of it. And we try to extract as much of the information as possible. So we try to, for example, uh, detect uh, if something is a road automatically or if it's a desert or if it's uh, an area that is suitable for building, or if it's a town, uh, something like that. Um, we automatically try to recognize those patterns. So if we are able to recognize that, wow, this is a building, 
then quite possibly this another thing is going to be a building and this is going to be building um, we can't see cars <laughs> yet uh, but yeah uh, you just throw it to the let's say processor and uh, it spills out uh, automatically how many buildings is uh, on an image uh, what's the size of a, a yield of a crop that you can get um, and we try to run simulations on it. So as I mentioned, the uh, oil spills, we would like to simulate which way they will go. So we will take uh, two, three images within a span of, let's say, six hours. And from that, we are able to predict which way uh, it will most likely go. So uh, people can pr uh, prepare on dealing with that. So how do we actually use Python uh, in ISI? So, first of all, why we chose Python. And uh, the main thing is that we have mostly scientists in a building and everyone there uh, was able to write at least some level of Python. So, that was a no-brainer. They, they wrote a large amount of scripts. The quote quality was as it was, but it was still Python. Um, we are able to rapidly prototype uh, what we want to do. So. Little backstory: uh, the satellite that we are building is a prototype. It's the first in a in a world, and uh, there was never before a satellite that small that would be able to do the SAR images. And um, when um, our uh, CEO and CFO, or well, something, <laughs> uh, when they got together uh, with this idea of we would like to build it. Uh, they got some funds, but obviously you can't uh, hire right away hundreds of developers and uh, build amazing software for that. So what we did was uh, we did it a hackathon way. So we tried to invest uh, as least amount on software as possible at the beginning just to figure out does it actually work in space and does it make sense to invest a lot more on development um, later on. And as soon as we figured out, yeah, it flies, it sends back images, it was a great success, then uh, great, suddenly we are able to take the prototype and um, transform it into something uh, neat and uh, scalable and other things that we would like to hear about it. Um, and also Python has a lot of libraries ready-made for uh, science or actually space. So, for example, to calculate the orbit, you can just pick a library, feed it with uh, elementary data, and it will tell you where your satellite right away is. Uh, you don't need to do a whole magic around it. Um, and also web interfaces are easy to do. Uh, because we are a new space, we try to do stuff differently. And uh, again, it's 2019 now, so uh, web is quite blooming and we decided that it would be great to make uh, those interfaces in um, uh, in web and obviously in Python it's super easy to do with I don't know, Flask, Django. Uh, we do work with a lot of data and manipulating data with Python is a breeze. Believe me, the, uh, you just import pandas, few commands and suddenly you know, you know what you're looking at. Right, so we have now four worlds that are working together. Um, those are, uh, let's say, four major software components that we build. One is called Vision. Uh, that is our customer-facing part, uh, where customers can order something. Then there's Smooth Operator. Um, unfortunately for the company, I was in charge of naming it. It's a basically a ground segment. And uh, yeah, the, they surprised me with, uh, let's introduce yourself in, uh, to a company as a newcomer. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah and I'm going to create a new smooth operator. And then we were rolling with it. Um, then there's uh, image processing. So once the uh, data is taken down uh, into uh, the ground segment, it goes through the processor. So from ones and zeros, it turns into this lovely compressed image. Uh, as you saw, um, well, with the better quality, hopefully, and then data services. So once we again have that image, we just put it through uh, all the machine learnings and AIs, um, and we get something. So this is vision. Uh, I couldn't take a picture because none of you signed NDA, uh, but uh, we don't talk about vision because it's Java. 
And this is my baby. This is what I started. Uh, it's, a, it's a ground segment. So if you imagine, uh, actually, I have it. Uh, so this is uh, an expectation of a mission control. I got it. Obviously, that's a proprietary image, and someone will sue me for it later. Uh, but I found it on the internet. So, and uh, <laughs> this, is, this is what you usually expect for a mission control. And uh, this is what I had in mind uh, when they hired me. Uh, but then I figured out that the reality is almost the same. This is how mission control usually looks like. Um, additionally to that, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, as I said, uh, I can't really show you all the details because of the security reasons and NDA. And uh, honestly, more I talk, the better the chances that I'm going to get fired. Uh, but uh, we're now doing uh, a lovely web interface for our operators uh, to work in. So they will not have to stare only on console. But they like consoles, so we can't phase it out completely. Um, so some responsibility of the mission control. Uh, we try to make it as easy as possible for operators to operate a satellite. That means that uh, the web interface uh, has to be nice and ergonomics. It's powered by uh, Python uh, and Django, and then lots of JavaScript that we, again, not talk about. Um, we would like to uh, we allow uh, tasking of our satellite uh, through that, so they can just do a few clicks and satellite knows what to do. Uh, we then provide back nice graphs and data uh, for engineers uh, to discover possible problems, and we also uh, try to determine if it's a problem automatically. Um, we schedule antenna times with our providers. So this is pretty much just make it as simple as possible for operators to uh, get it um, done. So we get the picture reliably. Uh, so under the hood, uh, we used to have a lot of mini apps. Uh, then we went to the good old monolith. And now we're trying to split it back to uh, small services. Uh, I hesitate to say microservices because uh, we're not there yet, but we're trying. Uh, we have all of that, so because we had small applications and everyone was developing their own uh, stuff before. So we had Django, Django, Falcon, Flask, and Tornado. We're trying to minimize it to Django with the REST service and uh, quite possibly Falcon uh, for um, very small services that operate with large data. Uh, we try to use Lambdas uh, and Athena because we've got a large data set coming down from the uh, satellite. Um, we use SQL, Alchemy, uh, and F strings are amazing. I really love them, so I had to mention them. That's Python 3.6. Uh, and we dockerized it all. Uh, now, really quickly, this is the image processing part. So this is how the science works. Science work. I have no clue about that. Uh, I just uh, stole it from my uh, colleague's uh, presentation, and uh, I'm sure he will be uh, very happy about that later on. Uh, it's also dockerized. Uh, we stored, uh, and this is from his presentation, we store two dimensional raw data in NumP NumPy array, then we process it, uh, and you know, um, this, this, and this. I'm going to skip it because of the time. <laughs> uh, and at some point, yeah, we have the uh, lovely image uh, at the end of the day. The amount of RAM that it uses at the moment is uh, great. 512 gigabytes was the last time I checked. Uh, we were trying to optimize that because that is just wow. Um, and in data services, yeah, we use Python, I promise. Uh, I forgot to ask them how, but I, I know they do, do use it. Uh, so is there a Python in space? Uh, well, yes, uh, sort of. Uh, that means that. We have, the satellite itself is programmed in C uh, because it has limited capabilities of motherboard and everything. So you have to save a lot of time and uh, a lot of space in space. And um, that, that part is definitely C. But uh, the tasking part and some of the commands we wrote in uh, Python and we just upload the Python part there. Um, so, uh, and this is pretty much it. Uh, get in touch. I have email. I have LinkedIn, I have Mixcloud. <laughs> I'm not really a social media person. Done. <laughs> Thank you. There's a lot of questions.
I, I can't answer them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you already answered some of them. Like, yeah. how do you actually use Python? Uh, yeah, we kind of do, do the satellites run Python code, or is it used only in processing data down on Earth? You sort of answer that. So yeah, just a, a little bits of Python, uh, but not a whole lot because of the reasons that I mentioned. Feel free to say next because next. some of those, you, yeah. <laughs> debugging in space, uh, is it safe? How does it work? What if debugging does not work? I'm, <laughs> I'm worried that the answer will not please anyone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let, let's not talk about that here. There's a social event later on that I might attend. You can ask me again. Things falling out of the sky? Or <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it never fall out of the sky, but obviously it's uh, not a safe environment to test. So, Got it. Yeah. What's the process of sending your star satellite to space, in brief if possible? We strap it to a rocket <laughs> and we send it out. So, <laughs> well, no, uh, last time, we, uh, pretty much what you need to do is uh, you hire a space on a rocket. Uh, so last time we flew with uh, SpaceX and uh, yeah, depending on the size and uh, weight, uh, you actually pay for per gram or kilogram. And that's it. Uh, there are some procedures that has to be done, uh, but not a rocket science again. <laughs> Okay, can you distinguish soil from a parking lot? So in the images. I, I believe yes. We haven't tried it yet, uh, but we can try. Usually on a soil you don't have the parking for disabled maps. And <laughs> <laughs> what operating systems do the satellites use? Uh, it's a modified Linux. So we still run on Linux. Nobody would be brave enough to run Windows there. <laughs> so Finnish satellite company using Finnish operating system, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. What's the download speed between the satellite and the Earth? Um, we have two different, um, uh, let's say, antennas. One is called S-band, one is called X-band. The S-band is in kilobytes, and uh, the X-band actually goes uh, quite fast. I think we are able to in 10 minutes download the 10 gigabyte image. So I forgot the real numbers, but yeah, it is, it is quite good. You can stream films out of that, but. <laughs> can you just go ahead and publish those images without any other you know, legal forms of authorization, etc.? Nope, 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 nope. Uh, I, I have to, obviously, uh, those images I uh, showed uh, were authorized uh, by our marketing and uh, we can and we do publish some of the images we do, uh, but uh, obviously because uh, companies are paying for their images, we can't publish their image. Uh, we can take it, we can uh, give it to them, but for publishing it, um, I can't do that personally. Uh, there are some permissions I, I have to ask for. Yeah, um, and uh, let me rephrase this question. I didn't ask it, but maybe are there any limitations on what, what kind of images you can publish as a company, even to the clients, and like no-fly uh, zones or something like that? As far as I know, uh, not really. It's a bit of a gray zone. Okay. Uh, since Cold War, everyone knows that all the sides are taking images of the other side, and you can't really prevent it, so they don't care anymore. Um, but we're trying to avoid that, so anyway. <laughs> Who is your launch provider? Uh, there was a SpaceX currently, and uh, before it was some Indian company, but that was before my time. Uh, I don't know. Uh, and we, we kind of change it, so there are a lot of providers, and uh, depending on a, on a window of opportunity and uh, the price, we're selecting them. And um, now it's time for lunch, but if you are ready, and, and if you want, we can still go on with the questions. Would you like to do that? Still more questions? So, some of them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so a couple more questions. Uh, one satellite every 24 days, 18 satellites every two hours. The math doesn't work out. Uh, not all of them will be on a polar orbit. So uh, we are trying to change those orbits and not always it has to go through the, well, for example, oceans, uh, like Pacific Ocean is not that important for people to take pictures of because nothing is really happening there, uh, important. Uh, so we're trying to make it work in a way that uh, it will cover most of the Earth rather than just middle of oceans. Do you think or fear that big powers are going to militarize space? I, can, you, can you repeat that? Uh, do, do you think or, or are you afraid that big, uh, big powers, like big countries, are going to militarize space? 
Uh, there is a real possibility as uh, the, one of the large uh, countries are already having a space force. Uh, so I don't know, they're starting to strap a laser on it or I didn't. We'll see, but yeah, there is a there is a real possibility that space will be militarized. It already is, given that uh, you're taking the image of your enemy already since uh, 80s or even earlier. Yeah. Uh, next question we already uh, touched on: Are there any privacy regulations or international law for the data? Surely there are. I don't know them. Yeah. <laughs> how much uh, data do the satellites generate per hour, and how do you store it when you download it? So, uh, one picture usually is around that uh, two gigabytes on a satellite. Uh, given the, there are some limitations that uh, what we can do, and the main limitations are uh, overheating, uh, battery, and uh, then also the storage. But the storage is quite big. I think we have like 250 gigabytes, so it can store it. But the problem is that per orbit we can take maybe three, four, five images and then the battery has to recharge. Um, and also uh, the other bottleneck is that currently we have uh, two antennas uh, or one antenna provider but two antennas on the poles and uh, only we can download maybe 10 and 10 gigabytes and uh, sometimes uh, that's becoming a bottleneck that means that we will have more images up there than down here. Um, and when it's downloaded, we kill it off the satellite and then we process it and we store it uh, on a cloud. Does every company like yours need its, own, need its own satellites? Can't you share them? If every company has 18 satellites or more in the future, won't get the space get crowded? I'm not sure if you have seen space, but it's big. But obviously, yeah, uh, there's a, we have a satellite partnership program, so we're trying to uh, partner with other companies to uh, share the satellite time, so not everyone needs it. We are, we are having satellites because we build them, but a lot of companies just need the data, so they don't need to then uh, you know, build their own satellite, they can use ours. Uh, they can pay for a amount of time, for example, and they, it, it is possible to use it that way. Mm -hmm. You already answered what, what SAR means uh, in the very beginning. Um, and since we have so many questions, I'm sorry, I'll just need to need to pick some of them. Uh, uh, the Kerbal Space Program is great. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, there's a lot of people that play in the companies and uh, uh, yeah, uh, we're trying to learn from it. Uh, but we're trying to learn from the mistakes they did. Uh, and it's a loud joke. Also, like, uh, it's not a rocket science, it's a loud joke. They're, they're, they are very lame, but very powerful. Since we have a lot of questions and not so much time, so uh, if you'd like to pick some of some of your favorite, go ahead and do that. Oh, I need to read now. <laughs> uh, so, are there requests for data censoring? No, uh, that was easy. Um, how well can radar see an oil spill uh, or the other surface without depth. Uh, oil spills are uh, quite easy to detect because they're dark, so the NC is not. Uh, but uh, we're mainly focusing on, a, on a oil spills on a sea, not on a land. Um, can a single satellite transmit data constantly? Do you have to let the batteries recharge between shots? Yes, you have to get the... Uh, battery the chance to, to recharge. Not only that, but uh, so when you take a picture, uh, the satellite has to position itself somehow. And it takes some minutes to get into a position to get the picture as good as possible. And uh, usually you can't take uh, pictures between each other around five minutes. You have to calculate with that. Uh, later on, when we have the full satellite array, we will uh, focus quite more on the optimization of uh, the whole idea. So that means that we're trying to make sure that the pictures taken will be uh, delivered as fast as possible. But it, it means that sometimes at least two, three satellites has to fly around the same area. Uh, aren't you afraid of space trash that can potentially hit satellites and make more trash? Yeah, this is a real problem. Uh, there are some services uh, that monitor at least the larger bodies of trash. 
uh, that we use, but uh, there's always a possibility that one day the satellite just went to sleep and it will never talk to you again, which is very sad. Um, they're, they're moving. <laughs> People are voting, it seems. Uh, you can pick one more and then we'll need to conclude. Okay. Um, something nice and easy, finally. Some of them, yeah, like what space agency we used that was the SpaceX uh, and a few others. Uh, some of them I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> What's the lifetime of your satellites? Uh, what happens to them once they are decommissioned? Uh, so usually uh, we're trying to exceed 10 years of data, uh, of lifetime. Um, the current generation has also something called propulsion, so we can uh, steer them and move them around. That's why I'm not allowed to do that. And uh, also, um, closer to the end, when we have to decommission it, it's very easy and nice. You just steer it down to Earth and it will solve itself out. Luckily, we have those small satellites, so there's no uh, chance anything will fall down. Good. I Thank think you so much, Jakub. <laughs> this is Jakub Balash. Thank you.